We're going to get started with our next uh, thought leader lecture in just a sec. So if you would take your seat, please. Oh, you all got quiet fast. I'm impressed. Good morning. My name is Frederick Brown. I'm the Deputy Executive Director with Learning Forward, and I'd like to welcome you to this next thought leader lecture. Uh, this is a very unique lecture because, as you know, by the fact that you're in this room, we're introducing something to the U.S. that's never existed. So we're very excited about this thought leader lecture on our set of principal supervisor standards. So I'm going to turn this over to Nicholas Pelzer from the Wallace Foundation, who will offer some introdu introductory remarks on behalf of Wallace. And then we'll turn it over to Mary Cano, who will lead this panel discussion. So at this time, Nicholas from the Wallace Foundation. Good morning. I heard nothing back, I, I heard nothing back Fred. One more time. Good morning. Thank you. I'm feeling the love. The Wallace Foundation has been working with states and school districts on better ways to train, hire, support, and evaluate principals for nearly 15 years. We supported the development of the 2015 Model Principal Supervisor Standards as part of our long-term commitment to develop and share knowledge, ideas, and insights aimed at increasing understanding of how education leadership can contribute to improve student learning. Now today, principals face new pressures to improve student learning while also implementing new academic standards. They urgently need better support so they can become the instructional leaders and change agents that we need. Now traditionally, the role of the principal supervisor has focused on ensuring that school leaders complied with district policies and state regulations. A Wallace Commission study by the Council of the Great City Schools found that principal supervisors are often stretched for time, insufficiently trained, poorly matched to the needs of their schools, and assigned too many principals to support. Emerging research suggests that principal supervisors can boost student achievement if they shift their, ro if they shift their world, their role, and their work toward hiring principals and helping them grow as instructional leaders. But principal supervisors are often not empowered to do this new work. They may spend most of their time dealing with district bureaucracy. They manage dozens of principals, and they dilute their impact because of it. Further, there is no national consistency across school districts about the title or the role. Many are not trained for an instructionally focused job. And while most are uh, former principals, the skills to run a building are not the same as the skills needed to coach and mentor other principals to lead instruction. It was clear that standards for the role of principal supervisor were needed. The new voluntary model principal supervisor standards provide a clear practical definition of what principal supervisors should know and be able to do. The standards highlight the necessity of principal supervisors to dedicate their time to coach and support principals. The students highlight the necess necessity of principal supervisors um, to engage in effective professional learning strategies to help principals grow as instructional leaders. Under the leadership of the Council of Chief State School Officers, a 12-person committee of educators worked on the principal supervisor standards for over a year. They are standards grounded in newly refreshed standards for school leaders known as the 2015 Professional Standards for Education Leaders. With that, please join me in welcoming Mary Canole, Council of Chief State School Officers. Thanks, Nicholas. And first and foremost, I want to appreciate so much the research and the ongoing support of the Wallace Foundation over the last 15 years. I'm sure we would not get to the point where we all know and understand that leadership matters without their strong effort. So thank you for that. This session is going to be a whirlwind tour of the standards um, by virtue of PowerPoint. And then I'm going to turn to uh, my colleagues here on the panel. Um, I'd like to introduce first and foremost um, Janice Harris. 
She is an instructional superintendent for the district of um, uh, school district in uh, DC, and she actually serves as um, a principal supervisor. As uh, Nicholas pointed out, the names for principal supervisors across districts are uh, varied. Um, so, you know, a principal supervisor in one district may be an instructional superintendent in another and have a completely different name somewhere else. Um, with Janice is her supervisor, and that is Amanda Alexander, the Deputy Chief of Schools for DC Schools. And Amanda um, actually supervises six instructional superintendents in her work. And then finally, we have Ben Fenton. Uh, ben is one of the co-founders of New Leaders Organization, and he also um, serves as their chief strategy officer. Um, Ben's uh, organization has been in the um, uh, business of preparing um, both principals and principal supervisors, so he brings a, a unique perspective to this conversation today. So let me go through um, the components of the standards, and then we're going to shift to a panel discussion where we can get into looking at uh, the work on the ground in practice. So with that, um, let me share that um, uh, Nicholas has said um, some of the things, uh, so I won't need to cover them. But I think uh, first and foremost, we all know that effective leadership is essential. And it's because of its link to student performance. It's because that it is second only um, to teaching as a strategy um, that contributes to student achievement. And finally, we have no documented instances of turning around failing schools without a powerful leader on board. So what's our vision for principal supervisors? First and foremost, it's different than what appears to be the managerial function of principal supervisors in most districts across the country today. But we want um, principal supervisors to be district leaders who support principals um, in their work in their schools. We want them to spend most of their time coaching principals so that they build principals' instructional leadership capacity. We also want them to work to create schools that are culturally and socially responsive and have equitable access to resources. And then finally, um, so importantly, we want principal supervisors to lead um, strategic change efforts both in the schools with those principals, but also in the districts, so that all programs um, are the highest quality. So why do we need principal supervisor standards? Well, Nicholas pointed out that right now principals are under an awful lot of pressure. Um, they are being held accountable for the performance, the high performance of every single student that comes into their schools. And Without that performance, they're likely to lose their job. What we find is that principal supervisors can be the support vehicle for these principals if, in fact, they focus on the right actions. And today's principal supervisors, unfortunately, are kind of pigeonholed into job descriptions that make them focus on compliance and regulation versus um, engaging in the important work that really can shift principal's um, practice and make it so much more effective. Um, the model standards are going to help districts ensure that principal supervisors um, focus on the work that matters. So what are these model principal supervisor professional standards? As Nicholas said, they're the first time ever, or I guess as Fred said when he started out, first ever standards for principal supervisors. It's important to note that they're voluntary and adaptable. As a matter of fact, they're worth nothing unless a district or a state takes them and absorbs them into their own individual context. There are certain districts that the only principal supervisor in that district is the uh, su uh, superintendent. In small districts, superintendents don't have a lot of capacity in central office, so they are juggling this particular role of supporting principals along with the uh, myriad of other responsibilities that they have. Um, these provide a really great description of what principal supervisors need to know and be able to do in order to effectively support principals and grow their instructional leadership practice. 
and they are a product of a 12-member work committee um, that in my eyes, I got to facilitate them, was second to none. And um, I want to point out that um, Fred Brown was a member of that particular, uh, this particular work group, as, as was Ben Fenton. And the leader of our group is in the room right now, and that's Dave Volraith from um, uh, Department of Ed in Maryland. So Dave, if you want to wave for a second. <laughs> okay. So, um, and the other thing, as Nicholas pointed out, these are grounded in the new professional standards for educational leaders 2015. These um, two sets of standards are made to work together. So let's look at the slide that's up there right now. Um, grounding the development of our standards was a theory of action that was based on a question that the Wallace Foundation posed um, a couple of years back in regard to um, gaps in the research about the effectiveness of both principal supervisor and principal practice. So our guiding theory of action, this is what we believe will happen, um, and it still needs to be proven, obviously, but this is where we're heading. If principal supervisors shift from focusing on compliance to shaping principal's instructional leadership capabilities, and if they're provided with the right training, support, and number of principals to supervise, then the instructional leadership capacity of the principals with whom they work will improve and result in effective instruction and the highest levels of student learning and achievement. So as we thought, as our work group thought, it was so important to have a theory of action to serve as an underpinning um, for the standards we also felt it was absolutely essential to define this notion of instructional leadership. And it had been in, defined way back in the 1980s by an educator researcher by the name of Wynne de Bavoy. And his definition stated that um, these are the actions, um, instructional leadership are the actions that principals take or delegate to others to promote growth in student learning. Unfortunately, at the time, it was narrowly interpreted to mean such things as classroom observations, teacher evaluation, um, feedback, and coaching, which are all definitely um, instrumental in the role of instructional leader. But we felt it was broader than that. And if you look up on your screen right now, you're going to see that um, we ensure that our definition of instructional leadership also encompass, encompasses such actions as modeling learning for others, being the lead learner, confronting issues of equity um, that impede student learning, um, uh, recognizing and responding to cultural and learning needs of students, increasing the capacity of staff to improve student learning, making decisions based on how they affect kids and their learning, understanding the systems that affect student success, and finally, sharing and distributing responsibilities for student learning. If you take away one thing from this slide, I want you to see that all of these actions are very student-centric. And if you look at the new 2015 Professional Standards for Educational Leaders, you will see that all of their standards are focused on students and also are student-centric. So where did we get the influence for our um, principal supervisor standards? Well, we had two influences. We had feedback from practitioners. We did, oh wow, probably nine months of surveying and focus groups of not only principal supervisors, but principals, central office leaders, um, professional um, educational leadership organizations, and State Department of Ed. Um, we also um, had the good fortune of having Meredith Honig, um, a researcher from the University of Washington, um, serve on our development team. And we are very much aligned with their research finding that principal supervisors matter to improve student learning by working through principals and teachers, and specifically um, by helping principals grow as instructional leaders. So what does this mean? 
Well, it's a huge shift for the field. We're asking principal supervisors that in most districts today, unless they're working with the Wallace Foundation or New Leaders or University of Washington perhaps, um, they are in a compliance role and we're asking them to shift um, to a support role, the role of coach for a principal. And um, the principal supervisors need to spend significant time with principals in their schools. Um, and unfortunately, right now, they don't have the necessary structures in place to be able to do that work effectively. So we're asking central offices to redesign themselves. So in fact, that they are supporting the work of principal supervisors so they can support principals and principals can support teachers and of course teachers um, can support the learning of students. So it's all of this ongoing reciprocal relationship that takes place throughout the system. And finally, um, I think one more thing to, to think about with these standards is that they shouldn't be interpreted as a job description or an assessment tool necessarily for principal supervisors. Because what you're going to find is that these are aspirational standards. Um, the standards will inform job descriptions and assessment tools for principal supervisors, but um, uh, basically, they will serve as a continuum of practice for a principal supervisor. Um, most principal supervisors will not be ready to implement all of these standards right off the bat. It will take time. So now let's get into the standards, the whirlwind tour. And um, what I'd like to say first and foremost is that the document will be posted on the Learning Forward website. It is not in your app. Um, and it is also going to live on the CCSSO site, and I'll, I'll give you those um, web addresses at the end of uh, this short presentation. Um, the standards, there are eight of them, are meant to work together with each other. They're all integrated. Each standard is presented as a standard statement, which I will be showing you today, and also um, with it will be a short description of the standard. In addition, there is a list of dispositions that we feel all principal supervisors should have in order to be effective in their role. And then we have a set of actions that um, principal supervisors um, need to engage in if they are going to um, effectively reach the standard. What's important about the actions is that they are written in a sequence. They are written in a continuous improvement sequence where we start with um, actions pertaining to um, uh, uh, studying um, what needs to happen in the school, um, developing strategies to implement implementation of the strategy, and then an evaluation to determine whether or not the action got um, uh, the result that we were looking for. So let's now look at the standards. The standards are divided into three categories, and four of the standards, the first four, are part of the category under the name of educational leadership. Um, obviously, these first four, strat uh, first four standards speak to the focus of all of the principal supervisor standards on instructional leadership and building the capacity of the principal in that realm. Standard one, principal supervisors dedicate their time to helping principals grow as instructional leaders. I'm not gonna go into the actions, this is just a, a quick whet your appetite of the standards. Standard two, principal supervisors coach and support individual principals and lead principals' communities of practice to help principals grow as instructional leaders. Not only does the um, principal supervisor work one-on-one -on -one with a principal, but they have the responsibility for facilitating um, professional learning communities for groups of principals, and thereby modeling to principals what they are expected to do with their community of learners in the school. Standard three, principal supervisors use evidence of principal's effectiveness to determine necessary improvements in principal's practice to foster a positive educational environment that supports the diverse cultural and learning needs of students. Everything that a principal supervisor does is based on the evidence of principal practice. And so that principal supervisor is zeroing in and tailoring their support to each principal. 
standard four principal supervisors engage principals in the formal district principal evaluation process in ways that helps them, helps them grow as instructional leaders. Bottom line, yes, you make summative decisions with a, a, a principal evaluation process, but the focus of the principal supervisor's work is to use this um, evaluation process as a tool to grow that principal's practice. The next category is district operations. It's the, up to the principal supervisor to also ensure the smooth and effective functioning of the district. Standard five is principal supervisors advocate for and inform the coherence and organizational vision, policies, and strategies to support schools and student learning. It's important to note that the principal supervisor plays a pivotal role. One foot in the school, one foot in the district. So it's not uncommon for the principal, uh, principal supervisor to see district policy not doing what it was intended to do in the schools itself. If it's not supporting the way it was uh, intended, the principal supervisor will get, go back to the district. And because of that feedback, the district will make, um, make changes in strategies and policies and procedures. Standard six, principal supervisors assist the district in ensuring the community of schools with which they are engaged are culturally and socially responsive and have equitable access to resources necessary for the success of each student. It's important to note that we have issues of equity are being addressed in each one of our standards, but we felt it was such important work and we're really not there yet at all. We don't do an adequate job with our attention to equity that we wanted to call it out in this standard six, much like the new professional standards for educational leaders called out this issue of equity. And then finally, the third category is all about district leadership. Standard seven, principal supervisors engage in their own development and continuous improvement to help principals grow as instructional leaders. The principal supervisor has that responsibility to grow themselves as well as their principals. Standard eight, principal supervisors lead strategic change that continuously elevates the performance of schools and sustains high quality educational programs and opportunities across the district. We want excellent schools all across the district, not in a portfolio of, a portfolio of schools that one principal supervisor may, uh, may actually supervise, but every single school in the district. So with that, let me just share the website where you can find this document. It's www.ccsso.org, and again, it will also be on the Learning Forward um, uh, website as well. But for now, I want to give special thanks to the Wallace Foundation for its support of this work. Um, if you've ever worked with this foundation, you know how firmly they believe in the importance of school leadership, school and district leadership. And then finally, special thanks to those that served on the um, standards development team for the principal supervisor standards. And in addition to all of these individuals, I would also like to thank CCSSO leadership. And I think perhaps in the room today, I know Holly Bothy is here. Uh, Mary Dean Barringer uh, will be coming in and also Janice Poda. So with that, we're gonna shift out of this uh, slideshow and we are going to move to our distinguished panel uh, to have some conversation with them. And I guess I'll play talk show host from here, seeing there's no chair over there. But um, I think I'd like to start um, with you, Amanda, and I'm gonna ask one particular panelist to respond to a question, but then I'm gonna ask the others to jump in. And we have a handful of questions for them. And at the end, um, we're gonna have, uh, have some time for all of you um, to ask your questions as well. But Amanda, um, you know, as a, as a district leader, I'm gonna ask you, um, how and why um, has the work of principal supervisors changed? You've been, you've been watching this for a while. <laughs> I have, is this on? Yes, it is. Um, the role of the principal supervisor has changed in the District of Columbia Public Schools because 
we realized that um, the focus on compliance was not getting us the results that we needed. That we needed. Um, we needed individuals who knew instruction, had the ability to go into a classroom with a principal, diagnose uh, instructional flaws, weaknesses, and then help the principal uh, chart a course of action to address those deficiencies. Uh, that's very different than having a superintendent um, require a principal to meet all federal and local state deadlines. So much so that I think the major shift that we did was we changed the title to, to signify that. They used to be called uh, cluster superintendents, at one point associate superintendents, and the title now is instructional superintendent to emphasize the focus on instruction. That's great. Ben, Janice, would you like to add? So I, you know, when I when I was thinking about this question, um, I think about Heifetz and Linsky's, uh, you know, balcony and uh, dance floor analogy, mm -hmm. um, and I thought was thinking about as a principal, um, you know, and when I started out, I was a principal for a, over a decade, um, and when I started out, you know, it was a waltz on the dance floor. Um, and maybe I could get up on the balcony a little bit and maybe see and, you know, and, and take and reflect on what I was doing, what I needed to work on. Um, but right now I feel like it's like a, it's like a house party um, on that floor. And, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, people, I, I mean, and it's a cacophony, you know, there's a lot of different music going on at the same time. And the principals are really challenged with a, a greater level of complexity um, than we've experienced at any other point. Um, in history. And so, you know, I feel like my role as the instructional superintendent, principal supervisor, is to help the, the principal uh, to be on that balcony um, for the principal, um, watching them on the dance floor, but then also maybe meeting them out in the lobby um, and saying, okay, what, where do you want me to be? Uh, you know, do, you know, can you, you know, can I get down there on the dance floor with you and um, help you side by side? Or can I, you know, can you come with me on the balcony and let's take a look at the, the bigger picture? And so, I mean, the complexities of the um, principalship really demands a, a new sort of leader to support that um, because they can't do it alone. Well, I know Ben has something to say about this new role of leadership. Yeah, I would just say that as much as we now expect principals to be great at developing teachers through ongoing feedback, their knowledge of instruction, and creating great systems of learning at their school, our principals need the same thing. And so the real focus of this role has to be a frequency of visiting with principals, just as Janice described, of giving them frequent feedback, of modeling for them what the kinds of feedback development and learning structures can be effective for their teachers and bring that to life. Great. Thank you. Thank you both, all three. So, Amanda, I'm going to circle back to you again. And um, I know you're supervising um, your instructional superintendents. How do they stay focused? You know, we just heard Janice talk about, oh, all of the, you know, responsibilities. How do they stay focused on instructional leadership? And is there some sort of relationship that has to take place with the principal supervisors and perhaps like um, an individual in, in charge of instruction, like chief academic officer at the district level? Well, I think Janice would argue that I demand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, will, will agree with me rather and say that I demand it. Um, so um, even our work at the table in my development of them in our developing of each other, so much of what we do focuses on professional learning. Every week when we gather for our weekly superintendent meetings, we engage in the discussion of professional literature or of the watching and analysis of uh, high quality teaching. The focus really is on professional learning, on instruction in everything that we do. In fact, I'm reminded of our selection process of superintendents um, in the past, candidates would come to the central office and engage in an interview with myself or some of our top principals, the chancellor, some of the chiefs, um, and that would be their opportunity to 
for us to assess their instructional chops. And um, two years ago, we changed that process um, to now include a more authentic assessment of the skills that we want. So now we take our candidates who have made it to the final round to a school for the entire day and they walk with me or someone else on our team uh, through the classrooms. Um, I, I'm looking to see what notes they take, what are they picking up on in our little hallway debrief. And then at the very end of that walkthrough, we engage in a conversation with that school's principal. And I wanna assess their ability to, to have a productive conversation with a principal to see if one, they were able to diagnose some issues and to sort of court out that, tr that course of action that I referred to prior. And then it's also an opportunity when the candidate leaves for me to get feedback from the principal. Is this someone, and this of course is a higher performing uh, principal in our district, that you could see yourself learning from, learning with. Does this person have you know, what you need uh, to, to help you be successful in your role as a school principal. So I would say um, that the focus is always on instruction and, and I guess that's why, you know, by, by having an interview that process that requires individuals to go to the schools sends a powerful message to the candidate as well. It lets them know that this is not you know, some cushy central office job where you're just gonna be pushing paper. <laughs> but that Alexander <laughs> expects you to be in the schools and to have your sleeves rolled up. You know, I'm proud to say that my instructional superintendents are very well versed in instruction. They know the difference between an A book and, a, and an MN book and that hump that second graders experience. Um, and I think that's, that's the shift. That's great. Um, ben, I, I saw you shaking your head um, in the beginning here uh, with Amanda's comments. Um, what might you add? Just the importance, and I think Amanda gave it very well, that across the curriculum and instruction office, if you have a large district, and then across the principal supervision, which we often see being in different teams, even if they eventually report up to one leader, having that very strong shared vision of what quality instruction is, I think is so crucial. What Amanda described as the systems to sit even at the principal supervisor level where you would assume this isn't needed to sit together on a regular basis, look at instruction, talk about what quality instruction is, do walkthroughs of schools together, and then to know who has the rights and responsibilities to bring instructional resources to the school. So there are often multiple systems of professional developers, coaches, and others being very clear as a system who directs those resources, how they can be gathered, what problems they can best be brought to solve between the principal supervisor team and the CNI team. Janice, would you like to? Uh, I, just, I just wanted to share sort of um, a, an example of one of the things that, uh, you know, one of our priorities is helping principals to develop strong instructional leadership teams. Um, and uh, so we have, we started this year having um, bi-monthly um, professional development um, sessions that are for academic leadership teams, not just the principal. Um, and I'm, you know, and every month that every time we um, have one of these sessions, I'm co-planning with uh, the deputy chief uh, in the Office of Teaching and Learning because there are some things that, uh, to, you know, there are things that we need to be doing together um, to really uh, move our system forward. Great. Well, Janice, hold that mic because this is the holiday season, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to state your wishes. Um, serving as an instructional superintendent, what kind of support um, are you looking for from the district for, first of all, the role of instructional um, superintendent or in generic principal supervisors and individually as a principal supervisor? What do you need? Well, I can say that I wouldn't have made it um, <laughs> without the professional development. I mean, I think that was the, the biggest key in, in um, really understanding what my job is. Uh, I think it's really important to, to, you know, I've come to realize that it's not about being super principal, and I think these standards really speak to that. It's not like, like I was a good principal in my own building, in my own context, but it's sort of how can I influence others to understand their own context uh, their local contacts and also influence them to, you know, um, you know towards increased student achievement. 
Um, and so I think the professional development that we do on a weekly basis helps me to really take some time to reflect, um, to read the articles about the, you know, about the emerging role of the instructional superintendent um, in addition to specific content area um, pieces. And it also gives me an opportunity to um, uh, calibrate with the other job alike partners. There are nine of us in the district. And, um, you know, and work together with them to really solve some, you know, complex problems. We, we talk, we have problems of practice, we uh, visit um, schools together, and I think that camaraderie was essential. Um, I also want to shout out, there are a couple people here from Tulsa. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, visited them, they visited us um, and fought, shadowed us and really given us some really excellent feedback. I mean, I, I don't think as a principal I got much feedback at all. And I feel that in my current role, I've gotten so much feedback about how I can get better in my practice um, that I have grown tremendously. So I, I think PD is the foundation. Um, what about span of control? So I'm ah. getting to that. <laughs> so I feel very blessed to have a you know one to twelve ratio. I, I supervise twelve schools, and uh, we each have between twelve and fourteen schools. Um, but the more that I learn about my job, um, the, the more that I feel that I'm doing better, the, the more I realize that I don't have enough time to do this, even with twelve leaders. Um, because some leaders require a lot more, and you know some, and they deserve more. Uh, and the more that the more that I, you know, I think the better that I get at my role, the more that I see that it would really be um, better to to have fewer. Um, you know, and, and we've talked about <laughs> this, Voss. Um, <laughs> Dear and, Santa. You know, and she, and, and, <laughs> right, it, you know, I mean, and it really is about span of control. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think the ratio is still, is still a little high, um, but I, I think having a boss that sort of helps to move these other compliance things and say it's okay not to respond to that email about this um, because I want you in the schools and, you know, I don't want you to focus on that. I mean, that's been, that's been um, very integral. Great. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks, Janice. I yeah, hope we didn't yeah, put you on the spot. But block that piece out of the video. Yeah. Oh, there yeah, you I go. I do respond to all emails. There you go. Short. So, um, Ben and Amanda, do you want to um, say any more? So I think you are hearing from both Janice and Amanda a great vision of what the kinds of district supports for principal supervisors need to be and should be. I will say a flip side of that is unfortunately we hear, having trained over a thousand principals, over 50 of them now become principal supervisors in systems around the country. When we talk to them and we survey them, the first thing they say is, no one told me what my job was mm -hmm. when I got it. It was, and, but they say something different then, but then I met all the other central office leaders. They all had an idea what my job was <laughs> to serve their needs and their time and their communication. <laughs> So it's <laughs> crucially important to use whether these standards or to adjust them for your own districts to be very clear with folks in these roles about their priorities of time, what you expect of them, and especially being in schools, seeing the work of principals on the ground, that gets directly to the span of control issue. You can't do that. You can't know the context of a school and the practices of enough principals if you're managing more than 30, even more than 15, we would say. Uh, and then the other piece is, this is a role that still does need that ongoing professional learning that is all about the group learning you heard Janice described, working together on do we see principal practice the same way, do we see instruction the same way, how do we manage our time to do these things. And then the last thing that I would say is, as you develop this role, really think about when do you need them to be central office leaders, that's time in committees, time in decision making, time in other structures, and when are they really out in schools working as principal developers? And you want to really be careful about that ratio because so many systems have built up a history that they are sort of central office committee members, firefighters, et cetera. So a couple of things to think about as a district supporting. Great, thank you. Amanda, I don't know if you want to add or they, save it. <laughs> that they have definitely said it all. Um, I really think that once you, um, shift your thinking, then you need to organize around that. Janice and I had a really good taxi cab 
conversation on the way over here as we are preparing to bring on board uh, about three or four new superintendents next year. What are those skills and dispositions that are really needed? I mean, our thinking has evolved um, mine in just the last five years when I first became a principal supervisor. I was a really good principal at two schools, you know, raised test scores, double digits. But in retrospect, I'm not sure if at the time I had all of the skills necessary to be a supervisor of principals. I'm fortunate that the diversity of my experiences um, between New York City Public Schools and Washington, D.C. Um, gave me a lot of what I needed in the context of a DC's uh, public schools. But it's a different skill set, and I think that would be the point that I'd want to drive home, that a good principal doesn't necessarily make a good supervisor of principals. A principal supervisor needs one, of course, to be really skilled in diagnosis, as I said before, but it's really about you modeling change, leading change, helping people get better at what they do. That's very different than you having had the skills in an individual school building to get that individual school uh, to higher levels of performance. Thanks, Amanda. We're about, um, we have about 10 minutes left for our discussion. So I'm gonna go back to Janice again, and um, I like putting Janice on the spot because it's all about you today, Janice. <laughs> But well, thank you. <laughs> doesn't, I'm sure you don't get that all the no. time. So, <laughs> But um, I guess I'd like to know, um, does the district's work change? And I, I think um, both Amanda and Ben have alluded to this already. But how do you see the district changing in their support to this um, new role of principal supervisor or instruct, excuse me, instructional superintendent? So I don't know if you can bring it back up, but that um, the standard uh, five, I think it was, um, the, the, well, that we advocate for and inform the coherence of organizational vision, policies, and strategies to support schools and learning. Um, up there also is a standard six. Um, and, um, and then if you go to your next slide, um, I, I was thinking about standard eight um, leading strategic change. I, I feel like that is the area that we're working on as a, as a district. Um, and people have to really understand what the new role of the instructional um, superintendent or principal supervisor is and, and buy into that vision. Um, I feel like um, even since last year, uh, our role is evolving and we're having more influence um, because people see that we can be key levers to school change, um, you know, we are invited uh, to, we're, we're now um, going to be part of the vetting process for the budget, um, which was last year, it was okay, uh, here are the budgets, um, you just sign off on it, click this and say yes, and you know, if you have a question, you have like 12 hours um, to turn it around. And this year, I, I feel that we have been, um, you know, sort of given a seat at the table for decision making. Um, so I feel like the org chart um, has to change in terms of sort of how we, rep how we interact with each other, not necessarily sort of the hierarchy of the org chart, but sort of how those arrows point to each other. Um, and, um, and I feel that that's how we get a chance to um, influence uh, the, the policies in, in our district. So. Um, there, there's a, there is a lot of change still to be made um, in, on this front. Oh, that's great, Janice, and um, I think I'm going to uh, jump to the next couple of questions because um, both Amanda and Ben will have time to um, respond to this question about district change as well in that. But clearly, um, this whole notion of principal supervisor is a work in progress right now, and it's a learning curve for both the principal supervisor and the district. So Ben, I'm gonna to shift to you now. And um, you, you are working with many districts across the country. Um, does this role of principal supervisor play out the same in every district? And um, what does it mean in particular for smaller districts? We don't want small districts to just say, well, we don't have the capacity to do these standards. Um, so what do you suggest? What do you, what do, you do? Yeah, I think we do see across the districts we're working with, once they come to this vision 
of a principal supervisor role and of the role of principal supervision to develop principles, many of them are creating structures like you've heard about from DC, much lower ratios and roles that are quite dedicated to this kind of principal development. Some larger districts are still sort of keeping one role responsible for many principals, 30 to 50, but even in those cases, they generally have staff that are then getting into schools much more often, feeding into both the evaluation and the development of principals, uh, and creating in those sort of more pyramid structures. I think the tougher questions are for small districts. And for them, I would think much more about reading this list of standards and thinking this isn't about one person or one person's role, but how do we accomplish all of these activities especially the first four around building instructional leadership and developing principles. So whether that would be a, a superintendent talking to a chief academic officer, how are we gonna split this time? Who's gonna be in schools that frequently is one of the crucial questions to ask. Are there ways we can work with our regional centers or education service centers to bring principles together in professional learning to cover that part of that standard while we still go in and do some of the key one-on-one -on -one work to give feedback to know what their needs are I would think about it more reading through this and saying, how do we as a small team then accomplish this on behalf of our principals rather than a one new role to tackle in that place? Great. And Amanda and Janice, would you like to uh, follow up with Ben? Oh, good. Okay. Um, and then another question. Um, how do you use these um, principal supervisor standards as a lever for change in the district? And I'm, I'm not talking just about principal supervisor change, but also um, the work of principals and also the work of the district. Yeah, I think the first thing to come to is to say, does the whole central office, not just sort of a chief of schools or head of school supervision, believe in something like this standards. I would want to see a whole central office team come together and say, do we believe in a vision at least like this, to write down a name, this is what we think this role looks like. And therefore, in some of the ways that both Janice and Amanda spoke about, what does this mean for the rest of us? What does this mean for our academic and curriculum instruction team? How do we interact? How would the finance and HR teams interact with that? So there's a real agreement around the priorities of this role, where this role spends its time, and what that means. And so it's spending some real time revising these standards, adopting them how they want in their district, but as a whole district team. And then I think some other key things, as with any good set of educator standards, you go to some of the other activities Amanda spoke about. You're thinking about how do we then use this set of competencies or standards to decide who do we hire into these roles. And a lot of districts are now thinking at the forefront of this of, how do we pick out which of those great principles, which as Amanda said, isn't enough, do we think are gonna be good high potential for this? And we talked about Tulsa earlier. They actually have put together a real program to think about for some of their best principles. How do they get them ready for these roles? How do they have them do walkthroughs together with others even before they're hiring for this role to get used to doing that, to giving, to leading professional development sessions for their peer principles? for thinking about and being engaged in some of those district strategy conversations where they've got to have a viewpoint beyond the school level and get used to what those decisions look like. And so you can use these standards to think about how do you identify future potential, help them develop, and then hire folks into that along the way. Great. Amanda, Janice, would you I like agree. to? I agree. I think our next step in DCPS is to um, take these standards and engage the chancellor and the chiefs in a conversation, a deep dive about each of them. And I think that's you know, a good starting point for, for all districts, not necessarily that you will adopt each one in its entirety, but I think it makes for good conversation to take standard five, for example, which Janice um, referred to previously and engage in a conversation about that. I mean, for us in the district, I do think it's an, an area of growth. Um, and for us to just have collaborative conversation and to sort of reach consensus on what this new role means, I think would be very powerful and directly influence our practices going forward. Thank you. And I think with, um, in our case, there, there are nine of us in this role. So for me, I, I see this as sort of a, a way to help calibrate 
us across the district, you know, even, you know, at this point where, you know, this is what this looks like and maybe sort of building that out and saying, okay, what does this standard look like in our everyday practice um, and sort of coming up, uh, you know, with, with uh, some ideas that we all are agreed to. So it'll help us uh, calibrate across the system. Great. Thank you. I have one final question and then we're going to open it up. And the question is this, so I'm a district, I'm a state, I'm intrigued by these standards, I'm gonna go home and read them, but what happens after that? How do I get started? And I think you know some of your conversation has already captured that, but what resources are available to folks? I know in the standards document itself, there's a section in the introduction called Using the Standards. And in that, there's some actual um, self-assessment questions for districts to use and states to use to determine their readiness for moving in this direction of shifting the role of principal supervisor. So we know that's, that's one resource, but what else is out there? Our district has partnered with um, NTC to engage, our, and I think it's been very powerful, to engage our superintendents in the blended coaching strategies. You know, as I've said before, it's about coaching, mentoring, developing, it's not compliance. And we found our partnership with NTC, funded by Wallace, uh, mm -hmm. to be very uh, beneficial to our work. Great. Yeah, I would point to a couple of resources about sort of structuring the role, structuring the central office, in particular funded by the Wallace Foundation, a great work from the University of Washington and their researchers around a whole set of papers on central office transformation that really focus on this role. And there's a whole toolkit, set of materials, and even a survey around their set of standards that principals can take and say, am I getting this kind of instructional leadership support? So those are a whole set of things that central office teams can use along the way, uh, as well as a number of papers you can find at the Wallace Foundation and at the Gates Foundation on this role. Uh, the Gates Foundation paper on learning-centered leadership and a set of frameworks they've created around that. But then I do think the key piece is many districts that are doing this work, I think, at the forefront have invested in partners who are helping this sort of ongoing learning, this crucial role of professional development of the principal supervisors themselves as a community of practice and in doing their sort of coaching and feedback role. And again, we point the Wallace Foundation as a set of providers that they are working with and have recommended to their districts, New Leaders is one, University of Washington, New Teachers Center, New York City Leadership Academy, there are a number of others doing that work. One plug I'll put in for ourselves is that we are working to bring that group of providers together. And so over the next year, we'll be doing some work as a group of providers together to think about how do we best serve the districts who are trying to get this role right. And so we'll be doing some writing and publishing out of that by next fall. Great. Well, did you want, no. You, okay. Okay, all right, very good. We'll hold that. You may get the first question, Amanda. So at this point, I have somebody waiting first in the queue to ask a question of our panelists or about the standards. Good, good morning, everyone. Kathy Cox with the Education Delivery Institute. I have a, I'm intrigued by what you said, that uh, being a great principal doesn't necessarily <clears throat> prepare you for this. Excuse me. <clears throat> have you ever thought about someone that's never been a principal, for instance, a, an excellent teacher leader, being a principal supervisor? I don't think I've ever thought of that, um, to be honest, but I, I it wouldn't be impossible. I mean, I could see how a great teacher leader could um, eventually become a great principal supervisor, but I think you have had to have lived that uh, experience in order to even have street credibility with those who you supervise. I could see the coaching aspect of my role um, being done by someone who really had a really great coaching background. Um, I, I think the supervision, the actual evaluation part would be trickier um, if you've never been in the role, it, going back to what um, Amanda said about sort of that credibility and building relationships with, uh, building relationships with the principals, it's, it's really essential uh, to be able to be effective with them. So. You know, depends on the district and how they 
structure uh, their roles. All right, next question. Good morning. My name is Kathy O'Neill. I'm an educational leadership researcher. And first of all, thank you for giving attention to a topic that's needed attention for a long time. Uh, I think it's wonderful. My question has to do with some of the research we've been doing, and that is most of what you've addressed this morning has been assessment, growth and development and uh, coaching, mentoring, supporting people. With the feeding frenzy that we see at some state levels as far as principal evaluation, I really would like to know how you marry the two, how you're able to be uh, a relationship builder, a mentor and a coach, and still be able, whatever it is in your systems that you're doing, to give valid evaluation to support the process. Do we have a volunteer on the panel? <laughs> I'm glad you raised that question because that's something, that's a balance that we are um, working on right now. I mean, I think all of our principal supervisors in our district want to engage heavily on the coaching side of the work, but at the end of the day, they still are, you know, a principal's evaluator. Um, I think one of the things that we have done, which has made it, uh, has allowed us all to be more transparent with principals and their performance is to provide them with monthly written feedback. In the past, our principals would just receive feedback, formal feedback, two times per year, at the middle of the year and at the end of the year. Now, as a result of this new process, our principals receive feedback every month, um, and it's aligned to that mid-year and annual evaluation. The same standards that they're evaluated on mid-year and end of year are um, touched upon during this monthly feedback. So the form includes those six standards, and the, prin the principal supervisors provide a comment and some actionable next steps, um, and as a result, this year, I think we only had one um, principal challenge their, their final evaluation. Great, thank you. I think as we get deeper into the coaching work, um, you know, we, I've sort of taken the tact of using the coaching work in the personal leadership aspect. Uh, we have six domains that we evaluate principals on, and so, you know, the, the actual coaching, problem solving, I've sort of kind of left to one area um, and then when we talk about sort of how does that personal leadership influence instruction, influence talent, et cetera, um, we really kind of go on the data through our evaluation system. Um, so I, I try to balance it. It's tricky. It is something that we're continuing to work on. But I think if your principals trust you, um, then you can, it, you know, it feels good to me right now. Um, but I feel like I have a great relationship with my principals. Um, and I, I think that's first and foremost before you try to do, you know, wear those two hats. Great. We have one last question and one last minute. So I'll have you ask your question. Thank you. Uh, Jim Eicher with the uh, British Columbia Teachers Federation. I find your work uh, intriguing and uh, excuse my lack of knowledge in case my question is implicit in the work that you do. But in terms of your supervision and coaching, et cetera, that you're involved in, is there an expectation that your principals or your principal leaders or your superintendent people actually have to go back into the classroom and, and teach also? No, there is not. There is not that expectation. And have you thought about that piece in terms of being grounded back in the classroom? I have, I have not um, thought about that, but I will say that we try to stay close to teaching and learning as much as possible. That's what the, the weekly um, conversations are about. We are in school buildings, observing classes. Um, we know many of our teachers in our clusters by names. Um, and we, I think, try our best to stay close to the work. Yeah, I would just say our, in the districts in which we are coaching and developing principal supervisors, because in this country so many places have gone through a significant change in student standards and therefore expectations around the approach and the quality of instruction, that's a very big part of our work. We're spending a lot of time looking at classroom practices, doing school walkthroughs together, <coughs> excuse me, really talking about what is quality instruction, 
even if they're not going back to the classroom to teach, because many of them did not teach to those standards, the folks who are now serving as principal supervisors, and so they've got to get very familiar with that, have that very new and shared sense of what good instruction looks like. Okay. So at this point, I uh, would like to thank our panelists, so please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> And um, at this point, I believe it's time to turn it over to Fred. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know how this mic keeps getting so low. Um, thank you for the questions that you've all asked. I want to tell you that in your conference app, in the resources section for this thought leader lecture are two documents. One, the standards themselves. So you can go and actually take a look at, I know Mary mentioned that they will be up on the Wallace or the Learning Forward website, but they are now also in your conference app as a handout. So that's one, please take a look at that. And two, there's another f document in there that you'll find very useful. It was a report that was done by Paul Manna, and it really looks at what are the policy levers that we need to pay attention to as we think about this work around principal leadership uh, in states, and I believe as you look at this, you'll find the information relevant for provinces as well. So please take a look at those two documents. Thank you, Mary. Thank you to our distinguished panel, and thank you to all those who joined us this morning. We will now uh, end this session and we'll see you in the general session in the Potomac Ballroom. Thank you.